Many of their methods, however, are better. The doula medicos are truly great on pulses for extracting foreign substances, such as bits of iron cooking pot, a very frequent form of foreign substance in a man out here, owing to their being generally used as bullets. Almost incredible stories are told by black and white of the efficiency of these pulses. One case I heard from a reliable source of a man who had been shot with fragments of iron pot in the thigh. The white doctor extracted several pieces and said he had got it all out, but the man still went on suffering and could not walk. So, at his request, a native doctor was called in, and he applied his pullets, pullets, pullets. In a few minutes, he removed it, and on its face were two pieces of jagged iron pot. Probably they'd been in the pullets when he, it was applied. Anyhow, the patient re recovered rapidly. Is this? Uh, baths accompanied by massage are much steamed. The baths are sometimes of hot water with a few herbs thrown in. Sometimes they are made by digging a hole in the earth and putting it into a quantity of herbs and bruised cardamoms and peppers. Boiling water is then plentifully poured over these and the patient is placed in the bath and covered over with the parboiled green stuff. A coating of clay is then placed over all leaving just the head sticking out. The patient remains in this bath for a period of a few hours, up to a day and a half, and when taken out is well rubbed and kneaded. This form of bath I saw used by the Mapongwe in Igualas, and it is undoubtedly good for many diseases, notably for that curse of the coast, rheumatism, which afflicts black and white alike. Rubbing and kneading and hot baths are, I think, the best native remedies, and the plaster of grains of paradise, pounded up and mixed with clay, applied to the forehead as a remedy for malarial headache, or brow ague, is often very useful, but apart from these, I've never seen, in any of these herbal remedies, any trace of a really valuable drug. The Calabar natives are notably behind behind-handed behind it, behind, behind hand in their medical methods, depending more on juju than the bantus. In a case of rheumatism, for example, instead of ordering the hot bath, the local practitioner will woka his patient and extract from the painful part, even when it has not been wounded, pieces of iron pot, millipedes, etc., and in the case of dysentery, bundles of shred up palm leaves. These things, he asserts, have been by witchcraft inserted into the patient. His conduct can hardly be regarded as professional, and moreover, as he goes on to diagnose who has witched these things into the patient's anatomy, it is highly dangerous to the patient's friends, relations, and neighbors into the bargain. With no intentional slur on the medical profession, after this discussion on their methods, I will pass on the question of the dying. I will pass on to the question of dying. Dying in West Africa, particularly in the Niger Delta, is made very unpleasant for the native by his friends and relations. When a person is insensible, violent means are taken to recall to the spirit of the body. Pepper is forced up the nose and into the eyes. The mouth is propped open with a stick. The shredded fibers of the outside of the oil nut are set alight and held under the nose, and the whole crowd of friends and relations with whom the stifling hot hut is tightly packed yell the dying man's name at the top of their voices in a way that makes them hoarse for days, just as if they were calling to a person lost in the bush or to a person struggling and being torn or lured away from them. Hi, hi, don't you hear? Come back, come back, see here, this is your place, etc. This custom holds good among both Negroes and Bantus, but the funeral ceremonies vary immensely. In fact, with every tribe and form and form a subject, the details of which I will reserve for a separate work on fetish. Among the Okyon tribes especially, care is taken in the case of a woman dying and leaving a child over six months old. 
The underlying idea is that the spirit of the mother is sure to come back and fetch the child, and in order to pacify her and prevent the child dying, it is brought in and held just in front of the dead body of the mother, and then gradually carried away behind her, where she cannot see it, and the person holding the child makes it cry out and says, See, your child is here. You are going to have it with you. All right. Then the child is hastily smuggled out of the hut, while a bunch of plantains is put in with the body of the woman and bound up with a funeral binding cloth. Very young children they do not attempt to keep, but throw them away in the bush alive, as all children are thrown who have not arrived in this world in the way considered orthodox, or who cut their teeth in an improper way. Twins are killed among all Niger Delta tribes, and in districts out of English control the mother is killed too, except in Oman, where the sanctuary is. There twin mothers and their children their twin mothers and their children are exiled to an island in the Cross River. They have to remain on the island, and if any man goes across and marries one of them, he has to remain on the island too. This twin killing is a widely diffused custom among the Negro tribes. There is always a sense of there being something uncanny regarding twins in West Africa, and in those tribes where they are not killed, they are regarded as requiring great care to prevent them from dying on their own account. I remember once among the Tishui trying to amuse a sickly child with an image which was near it, and which I thought was its doll. The child regarded me with its great melancholy eyes pityingly, as much as to say, a pretty fool you are making of yourself. And so I was, for I found out that the image was not a doll at all, but an image of the child's dead twin, which was being kept near it as an habitation for the deceased twin's soul, so that it might not have to wander about, and, feeling lonely, call its companion after it. The terror with which twins are regarded in the Niger Delta is exceedingly strange and real. When I had the honor of being with Miss Selser of Oik of, at Oikyan, the first twins in that district were saved with their mother from immolation, owing entirely to Miss Selser's great influence with the natives and her own unbounded courage and energy. The mother in this case was a slave woman, an eboy, e -boy, the most expensive and valuable of slaves. She was the property of a big woman who had always treated her, as indeed most trade slaves are treated in Calabar, with great kindness and consideration. But when these two children arrived, all was changed. Immediately she was subjected to torrents of vir virulent abuse. Her things were torn from her. Her English China basins, possessions she mo valued most highly, were smashed. Her clothes were torn and she was driven out as an unclean thing. Had it not been for the fear of incurring Miss Seltzer's anger, she would, at this point, have been killed with her children and the bodies thrown into the bush. As it was, she was hounded out of the village. The rest of her possessions were jammed into an empty gin case and cast to, cast to her. No one would touch her, as they might not touch, touch as they as they might not touch to kill. Miss Seltzer had heard of the twins' arrival and had started off barefooted and bareheaded at the pace she can go down a bush, tra bush path. By the time she had gone four miles, she met the procession, the woman coming to her and all the rest of the village yelling and howling behind her. At the top of her head was the gin case into which the children had been stuffed, on the top of them the women's big brass skillet, and on top of that her two market calabashes. Needless to say, on arriving, Miss Seltzer took charge of affairs, relieving the unfortunate, weak, staggering woman from her load, and carrying it herself, for no one else would touch it, or anything belonging to those awful twin things, and they started back together to Miss Seltzer's house in the forest clearing, saved by that tact, which, coupled with her courage, has given Miss Seltzer an influence and a power among the Negroes unmatched in its way by that of any other white.